uh, we would do uh, a webinar on understanding organizers and designs using qualitative methods. I could think of no other better person to invite to be a part of this journey uh, than Philip Trutship, who is at uh, WU Amsterdam. And I'm at Penn State University for those people who do not know either one of us. And um, you'll see later on as to why um, his presence is so important for this. And I will let him speak for himself later on. Um, I've been interested in uh, technological and organizational designs right from my engineering days. And so has Philip been. He's a pilot, by the way. He can fly a plane. So he's uh, both an engineer by background, but also an organizational theorist uh, as a background. So I just want to keep on going. Um, um, and he will introduce himself when he comes on. The way we want to do this is um, parts. It won't be for nine, um, one hour, as I promised uh, uh, Fanish just now. It's going to be a little bit longer. It's going to be about 90 minutes. Uh, we had request for two hours, but that is too much, uh, we thought. Um, when initially Fanish approached us, um, then he said, would you please do a real-time qualitative um, workshop? That means, you know, guide the people through uh, with data. And uh, what we did was we tried to put together some data, which we did actually, slices of data. But then uh, as we kept on practicing and trying to do this, we realized, you know, it was almost impossible to take a group of people through the really complicated and in-depth data that we have. Instead, what we will do is we will guide you through that process ourselves uh, with a few breakout rooms. Uh, but of course, you can reach back to us because you will see that we'll not even do justice to what we did for the last 10 years with this kind of data. So the way we are going to do this is um, um, uh, the agenda out here, which we have proposed is uh, we will talk about assumptions around organizational design for about 15, 20 minutes. These are all uh, rough uh, ideas about time. Um, so we might uh, spill over a, a little bit here and there. Um, then uh, what methods can we use to study design? Um, and uh, what uh, do we want to accomplish with those methods? It'll become a little clearer as I go further. Um, then uh, we will shift over to uh, Philip, who will, um, at 3.0, he will talk about understanding the design of Atlas CERN. Uh, just as a background, he'll come back to it. It was uh, the instrument and the group of people who were able to identify what is called as a God particle. And um, uh, around that was uh, the movie, which was Angels and, and Demons, if you remember, you know, if you don't want to know about God particles. But it is uh, one of the, uh, the, the, the bigger uh, scientific discoveries of this century, by the way. And um, so he's going to talk about that. And finally, this, uh, depending on how much time and energy, we'll have some con concluding remarks. In terms of um, questions and answers and all that, so uh, please raise your hand or send chat. And I normally tend to ignore all of it in any case. So, um, but if Philip tells me something has to be done, I will let you know because I've got one screen. I can't see anything else. But of course, if we want this to be participative and I wish we were together physically, but virtually also uh, will do. I wanna begin with, uh, you can start from multiple sources for what is design. But um, you know, you, you got a lot of people on this audience as well, and we too were influenced by Herbert Simon's work. Um, and I'll just read this quotation for you. The possibility of creating a science or sciences of design is exactly as great as the possibility of creating any science of the artificial. The two possibilities stand or fall together. So this is a quotation from his book, Sciences of the Artificial. And you know, he was very interested in that, in engineering and, and, and medicine, and uh, how do you design these things? And um, as a starting point, uh, what has happened, at least in our field, if you were to take Herbert Simon, who was a collaborator with uh, Jim March, and March and Simon you know, wrote uh, uh, plenty of books and were very, very um, informative about uh, organizational designs. Um, at a very broad level, it, it went into two directions. One direction was a notion of near decomposability and which led to what is called as modularity. And it led to architecture and interoperability and all those kind of nice things, uh, standards and stuff like that. And that's a very important strand of design which is going on in terms of both technological designs and organizational designs and how the two of them mirror with each other. And that is, you know, Carlos Baldwin and many other people who have done, who have been doing that. And it's getting into platforms and all that. But there's a second side of Herbert Simon, 
which uh, we will come back to as well, in which he talks about design as being emergent, in which you start doing things and it opens up new possibilities. So these were the two um, parts of design which were already Im implicit in H Herbert Simon's work in the sciences of the artificial. I'm going to show you a, a transparency, a, a PowerPoint, which is rather complicated. Um, and uh, I don't think I can do justice to all of it. Uh, but this is what uh, we have been playing around with for the past, I don't know how many years now, at least 10 years for Atlas CERN and, and many other projects of ours. Uh, these, these are just to give you a way of looking at things. And last uh, uh, webinar, you know, we had uh, Nicolet talking about complexity, and you'll find complexity also out here in terms of functions, in terms of interdependence, in terms of vertical, which he was talking about. The way we are approaching it is uh, as follows. You know, we are looking at the relational parts of design, the temporal aspects, the temporal dimensions of design, and what we call as the meaning making. How do people really experience that and how do you understand design? So um, briefly, and once I finish this, if you have any questions, we'll stop for a few minutes. Um, well, of course, we know about hierarchy. And actually, it comes from Herbert Simon's work of decomposability, and that it gives you the hierarchy. Uh, the notion of heterarchy, by the way, which uh, many of you are now talking about, uh, Nicolet also spoke about, is that you're in, interacting or interacting with, a, it's a peer-to-peer -peer network kind of uh, structure. But it's, it's more than that, you know, that the different elements have got different values involved. So uh, the, it complicates matters, you know, that uh, you're not only negotiating how to do things well, but uh, the question is, what exactly do you want to do? Um, so that's the notion of heterarchy that we will go with. Uh, that means agency rights are distributed um, and they are not concentrated. Um, and the notion of hypertext, which we, we will illustrate with our uh, Atlas CERN, uh, it comes from Nonaka's work um, um, uh, on, on hypertext organizing in which you could be a boss of someone in one kind of uh, hierarchical structure, but that is intertwined with some other uh, structure in which someone else, the same, uh, someone else who's your subordinate can be a boss in something else. So these are multi-layered, decentered, and distributed. So, okay, so that's the first part of relationality, that how do you relate with either, um, um, you know, people and also things as well. Uh, I already mentioned, you know, are you, is, is the relationality driven by single values or multiple values? The, mo the, the moment you go with multiple values, you really complicate matters quite a lot. For most part, we think about organizations as, you know, maximizing profits for shareholders. But uh, if you take a stakeholder point of view from Ed Freeman's point of view, then you've got um, uh, stakeholders with different values. Um, let me go further. Um, I don't want to get uh, stuck up on any of these um, uh, coming from Gareth Morgan's work on uh, uh, and, and, and on cybernetics. Do the parts, uh, do you have redundancy of parts uh, because of failures or do you have redundancy of functions? And the redundancy of functions is that each part has got multiple functions. And so that is uh, where we will go with interlaced knowledge. I'm kind of giving you a preview. Um, okay, so uh, I don't want to get into a lecture mode, actually, by the way, but it's happening that way. Uh, nevertheless, uh, the, the temporal aspects, and this is something which has been a big shift for me, is there's a gentleman called Nicholas Rescher. And Rescher talks about two kinds of uh, approaches to viewing the world. One is that you see it, uh, the world as uh, full of substances or entities, as he calls them. And these entities have got, have got fixed properties and fixed identities. And then you try to change them. And the other side of it, the other view is that the world is always in flow and in flux and it's always, it's a process. And your big job then is to try to, uh, to fix that so that you can operate. So the substance approach to life or entitative approach to thinking about phenomena or a processual way. So designs too are like that. You can think of design as an, a noun, as, a, as if it is given, it's pre-given or a design as a verb that is always changing. And so that's what the second bullet point, you know, do you try to bring change given structure or in the, from the process point of view, do you, do you try to bring in structure given change? Um, and of course, structuration is right in the middle. That is every action uh, creates a, an outcome which becomes a medium for new action. Uh, it's directly come from Giddens work, uh, which uh, we just wanted to bring that in as well. 
Finally, let me come to the meaning making aspects of the assumptions. Um, so uh, it's all very well to talk about relationality and temporality, which brings in more dynamics. But the question is, how do people view the design? How do they experience it? For most part, of course, we, uh, for a long time as an engineer, you know, the, the, the design is pre-given. It is done ex ante. Uh, but uh, we also have situations where design is, uh, is emergent. And uh, none other than, for instance, if you go back to Henry Mintzberg <clears throat> in strategy, or even Herbert Simon, the second part of his work, you know, that it is emergent. And I put in two words out here, <clears throat> excuse me, um, interactions and interactions. Uh, interactions is what we typically talk about. That means I am interacting with you right now, or I'm not even interacting. You're, we are using Zoom as a, as a medium. But what happens in the interaction is our identities don't shift as a consequence, or the properties or the materials or the functionality does not shift. Intra, intra actions is coming from Karen Barad's work. Um, and Karen Barad talks about this being a very fundamentally different things that in the very uh, meeting of people and things, the properties and identities shift in that process. So we can have uh, interactive process or interactive processes. Um, <clears throat> let me talk about the remaining two bullets in the uh, meaning making, which is the Tamara of organizing. This is coming from David Boge's work. Uh, his ASQ piece was, you know, what are, what's this all about? So we are in unfamiliar territories, uh, uh, you know, uh, where there's a disruption and people are asking ourselves, what is this all about? And um, I have to bring that out because we are going through COVID uh, pandemic time. Um, the, we have been doing some research and most people have been trying to figure out what is this all about? How should we organize? Uh, uh, how does the design really play out? So this takes us to anti-narratives um, and speculative bets about designs, even as it has been uh, unfolding. Uh, the final bullet point in terms of assumptions is, are you taking an ethic approach or an emic approach? Um, this is coming from ph phonetics and ph uh, ph phonemics. An ethic approach is the outsider approach. So you look at the, um, uh, the issue uh, which has been designed or operating from the outside. And uh, this is outsider's point of view. And of course, an outsider's point of view is very valuable. We know that. Uh, but at the same time, also, it is problematic, you know, because it, it does not take the insider's experience point of view. And the emic approach is that insider's point of view. That's how, do they, how are they experiencing it? So when you open up the technological design black box, you'll find that different people are experiencing it in a different manner. So this, these are our assumptions for the moment. Of course, you know, we could have taken some other assumptions, but the, in terms of relationality, temporality, and meaning making. And what I did was uh, put this together in some kind of, a, um, we're gonna have an exercise, we'll have a breakout room. And before we do that, if there are any questions, I will take it. Uh, but you have this, um, um, you know, relational uh, dimensions on the, for most part, people have been looking at social networks on the other side where I put why is social material. That means, you know, designs are integrally intertwined with social, social material uh, uh, pieces. Th this notion comes from actor network theory and actor network theory, they think of the, uh, uh, the material elements also as actants. You know, like if you have got a, a algo or an app, you know, that it's acting as well. And more and more you go into digital technologies, you'll find that social material approaches become more important. Uh, the temporal is, you know, change given structure and the other side is structure given change. Of course, I've given a double headed arrow. You could be somewhere in the middle as well. That means you could have, you know, a mixed or hybrid ontology and meaning making is pre-given or emergent. Um, I'm gonna stop here and uh, eventually, you know, I want you to go for a small exercise but uh, in which um, you will um, um, you know, give your views in groups as to what you think an organizational design is. And during your discussion, you will discuss, um, if you wanna use our terminology of relational temporal and meaning making, and you will post your results on um, the Google Docs. Um, and uh, if you, uh, Philip will send you a copy of this uh, URL uh, so you should, be, you, should, you should be having this. But before we go there and before the seven minutes start, because uh, Ruchika is going to help us with the uh, group's breakout, but not as yet. 
Uh, are there any questions that you have of um, me? And then of course, Philip can join if, if um, he needs to. By the way, I can't see if anyone's asking a question or not. So you can just speak if you'd like. If not, we will go to um, the website and uh, Ruchika, then I'm going to request you to split us up into groups. Uh, we have the link. Uh, we have the link in the chat box. So. Yeah, I need to go there myself. But anyway, so please uh, split us up if you if you don't mind. Yeah. Oh, there were four chats. I'm sorry. Okay, there there it is. Yeah. Okay. So. So everyone's now going into their breakout room. And you don't need to join, Steve. So you can stay back. Well, I'm going to join someone. Okay. So then after seven minutes, exactly, I, I'll break uh, the rooms, right? Uh, Ruchika? Yes. We're, we're a tiny room. Uh, should we join someone else? I just see yeah. room two is quite small as well. Yeah, yeah, I can do that. I thought I'll join otherwise. Okay, I'll do that. I love tiny. Very kind of you. <laughs> Thank you. I'll...